What's the worst thing that can happen when people post things on social media? Would it be getting the police's attention, like what happened to rapper Fredo and big-time scammer Valeski Barossi? Or would it be getting robbed for an expensive watch, like Parikh Jamo? Let's get right to it. Number 5. Lifestyle Guru Parikh Jamo is a French lifestyle influencer known for his cryptocurrency expertise. He has a master's degree in applied mathematics and knows four languages, English, Chinese, French, and Spanish. He lives in Hong Kong with his Australian model wife, Sarah Watts. Together, they enjoy a life full of caviar and champagne. In 2019, he founded the online banking site, Hi, with more than 30,000 loyal Instagram followers. Hi touts itself as a one-stop shop for cryptocurrency exchange and mobile banking. Jamo has thousands of followers and uses his influence and wealth to travel around the world in style, showing off the expensive accessories he brings with him. In December 2021, he made a post with his arm around his wife at a swanky Hong Kong restaurant with a Richard Mill watch on his wrist. A Richard Mill watch can cost up to $1 million. Stars like Kanye West, Ed Sheeran, Chris Brown, and many others often don Richard Mills. The company also has celebrity partners like Pharrell, golfer Bubba Watson, and actor John Malkovich. In the photo, Jamo wore a Richard Mill RM022 Aerodyne Dual Time Zone watch. It's made of material originally developed by NASA to be used on supersonic aircraft wings. The watch definitely isn't cheap. Jamo's watch comes with a six-figure price tag of $530,000. So, when one of his followers saw him wearing it on social media, Jamo seemed like the perfect target. In March 2022, Jamo and his wife were visiting New York City. It was Friday morning and they were coming home from the Sapphire 39 Adult Entertainment Club. They got out of the Uber at their Midtown Hotel when a man came up to Jamo and demanded his watch. Before he could answer, the man shot him six times in the legs and lower body. Jamo fell to the ground as his attacker tried to remove the watch from his arm, but Watts jumped on the man's back before he could take anything. The gunman fled, leaving Jamo bleeding on the city sidewalk. An ambulance came to take Jamo to Bellevue Hospital, and police recovered five shell casings from the crime scene. A surveillance video showed the suspect going into a porta potty to change clothing and then re emerging a few seconds later. He walked north on Lexington Avenue and dropped a dark colored bundle, possibly blood spattered clothing, in the trash. Another person came by a few minutes later to take the pile. According to the NYPD, the suspect fled with an unknown female accomplice in a black four door BMW. This is all the evidence police have to go on. No one has been arrested or charged with shooting Jamo. Jamo doesn't think his social media was to blame. Instead, he thinks someone knew that he had the watch and followed him to his Manhattan hotel to find the perfect time to strike. Number 4. Funky Friday Fredo is a hip-hop star known for his hit single, Funky Friday, which hit number one on the charts in 2018. His mixtape, Tables Turn, made it into the top 10 charts. Fredo, whose real name is Marvin Bailey, is from London and references his tough upbringing in his music. Fredo told the media that he was once stabbed four times, but he hasn't just been the victim. He spent time in prison in 2016 and 2017 for knife-related charges. He's now known for his social media posts, bragging about his private jets, wads of cash, bikini-clad women, and Harrods shopping sprees. But Fredo challenged this reputation, saying he'd rather use his money to get friends out of prison than flex his cash on material things. That didn't seem like the case, though, when Fredo posted a Snapchat of him strapping a seatbelt across 50,000 pounds back in October of 2019. Just a few minutes after posting the video, undercover police arrested Fredo, believing he had stolen property. Fredo and a friend were driving through London's jewelry district, Hatton Gardens, when police approached his Range Rover and asked to search it. Police seized a knife and wads of cash to put in an evidence container. Frodo's passenger was also arrested on suspicion of possessing a weapon, theft, and threatening the cops. Number 3. Spoiled Kids 
Ginny Ambula is a Colombian-born, Miami-based, self-proclaimed media influencer whose Instagram, when it was up, was full of flashy status items. She showed up to class in a Porsche, wearing designer clothes, jewelry, and bags from Chanel, Dior, Hermes, Louis Vuitton, and Dolce & Cabana. Ambula posted about how she uses her stacks of cash to buy shopping bags full of designer clothes and accessories. She's quite the jet-setter, posing for photos in Paris, relaxing in Milan, and Ibiza and buying VIP passes to Coachella. According to Ambula, she's a self-made woman with incredible business acumen and a large social media following. This might be a bit of a stretch, considering she only had 11,000 Instagram followers at the time. Little did Ambula know that people were keeping close tabs on her and her family. The last straw was when Ambula posted a picture flaunting her Porsche Cayenne and a bright red Lamborghini. While many of her followers hit the like button, she also caught unwanted attention from the Colombian Federal Police. Ambula's father, Omar Ambula, was a port inspector in Colombia for 27 years with a modest monthly salary of $3,000. His daughter moved to Miami in October 2013 to attend the University of Miami and get a bachelor's degree in finance. But Colombian investigators were suspicious. They discovered that her father, Omar, was funding her lifestyle and expensive college tuition. Further investigation revealed that he accepted more than $600,000 in bribes probably millions more, for allowing untaxed items to pass through Colombia's Buenaventura port. When Colombian police suggested that Jenny's life was funded by her daddy's dirty money, she denied it, arguing that she was a self-made woman who made her own money as a YouTube content creator and social media influencer. The Globetrotters' grand plans came to a screeching halt in 2019. Ambula was on vacation in her home country when Colombian police arrested her and her parents in connection to her father's money laundering schemes. After the video of Ambula being detained in a Gucci shirt went viral, she made her Instagram private and deleted her lifestyle website. Ambula was allowed to stay on house arrest while her parents were sent to Colombian jail. The moral of the story? Don't boast about designer bags and luxury cars if you bought them with money from international cargo bribes. Number 2. The American Dream Valesky Barossi came to America from Haiti with big dreams. Starting out, he couldn't even afford clothes at Walmart or the McDonald's dollar menu. He started working at the Michigan-based financial literacy and credit score repair business, Financial Education Services. From there, his career took off. By January 2020, the company named Barossi as one of the top 10 leaders to watch closely in 2020. He came to America as a Haitian immigrant with nothing but the shirt on his back. He was a real success story and a testament to the American dream. With hard work, he became the youngest executive vice president in the company's history and the first ever employee to do more than six million in sales. He started his own company and became president of V. Barossi Solutions, Inc. But by January 2022, everyone found out it was all a scam. In March 2020, as businesses began to struggle in the COVID-stricken economy, the government offered emergency financial assistance to companies and their employees. Congress approved over $650 billion in forgivable loan packages. Barossi saw this as an opportunity to get rich quick. This Fort Lauderdale resident wasn't the only one to participate in such scams. South Florida led the nation in fraud during the financial crime wave of the COVID pandemic. One businessman bought a $318,000 Lamborghini with PPP money, and a nurse lied about his business to lease a Mercedes-Benz and make a $475,000 child support payout. A North Miami couple claimed to be farmers to reap $1 million in benefits. There was so much financial fraud during the pandemic that the government created a specially dedicated COVID-19 Fraud Enforcement Task Group in 2021 to uncover relief fund fraud. They eventually tracked down Barossi, who scammed the government out of $4.2 in PPP money, meant to go to employees and businesses who were genuinely struggling. Barossi and some of his employees filed fraudulent loan applications that lied about the company's expenses, net profit, and IRS tax forms to request more than $4 million from the U.S. government. He received about $2.1 million. To go along with his American Dream success story, Barossi posted on social media about his luxurious life and his so-called hard work. He broadcasted photos of himself draped in Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and Chanel with captions like, from homeless to high-rise sky view, and you don't have to be great to get started. Get started to be great.
He also loved to show off his Lamborghinis and Rolex watches. He self-published biographies online where he called himself a seven-figure entrepreneur, an NFT creator, and an expert in marketing and e-commerce. The COVID-19 Fraud Enforcement Task Group started getting suspicious and the Secret Service conducted an investigation. They eventually charged Barossi with five counts of wire fraud, three counts of money laundering, and one count of aggravated identity theft. Barossi was supposed to stand trial but was exposed to COVID-19 in jail and almost had to spend an extra two weeks there in quarantine. But his attorneys fought for him to get out on a $200,000 bond. If convicted of his slew of charges, he faces up to 132 years behind bars. Number 1. Dumb Deals Braden Garza was your average 18-year-old high school senior, but he had more money than most of his peers. He posted on his Instagram with stacks of hundreds and twenties, which made Scapoose Police Chief Norm Miller suspicious. Investigators found that Braden wasn't just your average teen working overtime at the grocery store. He was actually conducting thousands of dollars worth of deals over Snapchat. Even though weed is legal in Oregon, it's only legal for individuals 21 and over, and there are strict limits about where it comes from. The then 18-year-old Garza was using Snapchat to send images of his products, communicate with customers, and conduct sales transactions. Police arrested him on charges of unlawful delivery and possession. The same day police served a search warrant at his home and incidentally found more than just Garza's stash, but they found his roommate's stash too. As soon as Garza was released on bail, he hopped back on social media to announce his support for Trump, whom he had hoped would have forgiven him of his charges. He talked about the negative attention he was getting Getting for his infamous social media posts, but he seemed to enjoy the attention. According to Garza, he has his MAGA hat to thank. She probably didn't think it all the way through when she decided to go for a quick cash grab with her ticket scam. But a scam involving having to ice a foot may just take the cake for the dumbest crime on this list. Number 5. Pretty Little Liar Hannah Valentine started her adult life off on the wrong foot. Looking for a way to make some easy money, she created numerous fake Facebook accounts, which she used to scam people into buying counterfeit tickets for Post Malone concerts and other events. To protect her identity, Hannah went by several aliases, including Natalia Sparrow, Daniela Walsh, Hannah Jane Matthews, and Jessica Lewis. Hannah created fake accounts based on these aliases and posted that she was selling concert tickets. People clicked the link, deposited money into her bank account, and then ended up empty-handed while a mystery girl ran off with their money. Hannah should have thought things through a little more carefully. For one thing, how would the people not find out the tickets were fake? As soon as they got to their concerts, they would know they'd been duped in an instant. Hannah also used her own bank account to receive the money, a mistake no intelligent scammer would ever make. But this wasn't her first scam. About a year earlier, when working at a nail salon, Hannah used a client's credit card info to buy $5,000 worth of beauty products, clothes, fast food, Ubers, and authentic festival tickets for her amusement. Hannah's parents paid back most of the victims. That, coupled with her age, basically got her off the hook. Hannah was given 12 months of intensive supervision and had to complete 240 hours of community service. Things aren't as easy as they seem for her, however. Hannah applied for a spent conviction to wipe the scam off her record, but her request was denied. She also claims to be a laughingstock. According to Hannah, people point and laugh at her when they see her on the street. On top of that, she lost most of her friends. Even her boyfriend dumped her due to the bad press she received after her case. She said she wants to study to be a nurse, but that goal seems out of reach after all that's happened. We can only hope she's learned from her lesson and leaves her dishonest ways behind her. Make sure you're only buying concert tickets from reputable sources. There's not much wiggle room when you buy them through a third party, especially if that party is a scam. Hannah was plain stupid, which is the only reason her victims got any money back. With a little more planning, she might have got away with it. Number four, the scamming mom. 
Jade Cheesley is a mom from Melbourne, Australia, and she scammed the Aussie government out of $102,000 by submitting several false claims to Centrelink. In case you didn't know it, Centrelink is basically their government-sponsored financial assistance program. Jade claimed she was separated, living out of her car with her kids, struggling to get food, and needed government assistance to get by. She received government support for years, and all the while, she was living large in a $565,000 home. She was still married to her husband, and the couple was far from financially needy. They owned two investment properties and had $780,000 worth of cars, savings, and even a boat. Mr. Cheesley owned a roofing company and made $226,000 a year, which was how the couple could afford such lavish things. Jade used the extra money from her scam on many things. One was family vacations. In 2015, she took her family to the Golden Coast, Honolulu, and Movie World, followed by a 12-day trip overseas later in the year. For her husband's 40th birthday, she threw a surprise party at the Craigie Burns Sporting Club after celebrating their anniversary at a luxury hotel the year before. Unfortunately for Jade, her extravagance ultimately led to her downfall. In 2017, the Australian government received tips from the public that Jade was better off than she claimed to be. Once there were too many tips to ignore, investigators raided the Cheesley's home to uncover the truth. Inside the house, they found Jade's cell phone full of incriminating text conversations. These conversations included Jade telling her husband to lie to Centrelink and say they were separated and asking him what he would do if he had to support her lavish lifestyle all on his own. These texts showed authorities that although Jade was the mastermind behind the scam, her husband was in on it too. All this led to a trial in which Jade pled guilty to dishonestly causing a loss for the Commonwealth and giving false and misleading evidence to a Commonwealth entity. She will now be served serving an 18-month prison sentence where she will get a taste of what living a hard life is really like. No more 12-day trips, no more boat rides, and no more extravagant parties. Just her and the rectangular cage she put herself in. Number 3. Self-Inflicted Malcolm Harrison needed insurance money and he may have gotten away with his scam. Except, he was caught on camera faking an insurance claim. The video depicts him returning from a jog when he almost trips and notices a half-broken pavement stone right in front of his house. The footage shows him talking to and laughing with a neighbor before smashing his knee into the stone five times. Malcolm then limps his way back inside, determined to make a case out of his so-called accident. Malcolm thought the CCTV cameras in the housing complex weren't on for some reason, so he injured himself in plain view of the cameras, cameras that were still running. He actually thought they were fake and just there to scare off any would-be intruders. Once he submitted the claim, it didn't take long for the insurance company to find the video. When housing agents showed him the footage, Malcolm tried to play dumb and insist that the injury was real. He even tried to block the screen so his mother wouldn't see what he did. He even tried to tell police that they were misinterpreting the footage, but the footage was clear as day. He walked up, drove his knee into the pavement on purpose, and then laughed about it with a neighbor. Nobody has ever been caught more red-handed than Malcolm. He also lied to his mom about the whole thing. You see, Malcolm has dyslexia and lives with his elderly mom. She filled out the paperwork for him to file the 6,000 pound claim against their landlord. He maintained his plea of not guilty until he stepped into the courtroom when he finally came to his senses and pleaded guilty to all charges. Malcolm will have to do 200 hours of community service to pay for his fraud. Number two, holiday in Zimbabwe. Thulal Bebe, a UK resident, tried to fake her husband's death to cash in on his 400,000 pound life insurance check early. In September 2016, Thulile sent Aviva a medical consent form and a certificate from a hospital in Zimbabwe claiming that her husband had died of pulmonary embolism on August 9th of that year. He was actually working a long shift at Charing Cross Hospital in London that day, nowhere near Zimbabwe. When Aviva agents uncovered this information, they sued Thulile and she was charged with a single count of fraud. The judge handed Thulile a two-year sentence, but it was ultimately suspended. She was a mother and a first-time offender, so the judge decided she could rehabilitate and pay her dues in other ways, deeming a prison sentence unnecessary. However, her nursing license was suspended until further notice, but that didn't stop her from applying for another nursing job the day after her suspension hearing. She intentionally left any information regarding her conviction off her application and worked 35 shifts before internal checks within her workplace discovered the truth. This was the final straw. Another hearing was held, and the board decided there was no other option but to strike her off the medical register. They ruled her conduct was fundamentally at odds with the association standards and that allowing her to continue her practice would reflect badly on the agency. Thulile and her husband were in deep financial straits, owing around 30,000 pounds before the scam. Some
Some speculate if Mr. Bebe was in on the scam and that he let his wife fake his death to escape his debt. However, the court found no evidence of this and Mr. Bebe was let off without any charges. Number one, cold feet. Brian Muyepa is a former Royal Artillery gunner and he sued the British Ministry of Defense for 3.7 million pounds. While he was in the military, he allegedly was in a cold tunnel with wet boots for five hours and that was what caused him to develop trench foot. Trench foot has been around for centuries. It claimed the lives of 75,000 British soldiers and over 2,000 American soldiers in World War I due to the high amount of trench warfare taking place. Trench foot causes pain in the extremities and heightened sensitivity to cold weather. It was common in the trenches of World War I, hence its name. The condition was widespread due to cold weather mixing with the water inside the trenches. Symptoms of trench foot include blisters, blotchy skin, swelling, a feeling of numbness, pain when exposed to extreme heat or cold, and loss of mobility. In many instances, soldiers had to get their feet amputated because of their condition. Unfortunately, the ones who couldn't get an amputation never made it home. Muyepa claims the Ministry of Defense breached their duty of care towards him and is seeking 3.7 million pounds in reparations, including 800,000 for the loss of his army career and 1.7 million to pay for caretaking. Muyepa claims he can't walk more than 100 meters, even with his walking stick. He claims he can't stand for longer than 10 minutes and his wife takes care of all of the household chores. We're not sure why that last bit is worth suing over, but to each his own. However, a video of him dancing dancing at a barbecue says otherwise. The video posted on Brian's wife's Facebook page outraged the Ministry of Defense. It blew his whole case out of the water as he's much more mobile than he claims to be. On top of this, one of Brian's army comrades told the Ministry of Defense that Brian talked about packing ice blocks around his feet to fool the tests into showing that he had trench foot when he really didn't. Now the Ministry of Defense is convinced the whole case is a fake. They don't plan on giving Muyepa one penny of his 3.7 million pounds claim. Boris Becker had an insatiable desire for the high life, including several homes, fast cars, expensive art, and a taste for dining in some of the world's top restaurants. His lack of business skills and controversial personal life haven't helped matters either. He appears to have suffered from terrible luck, strained working relationships, and poor decisions. Apparently, he also lost 10 million he invested in Nigeria's oil and gas industry. Becker almost lost his Maserati when his financial troubles came to light. They towed it away after he parked it illegally. Somehow, Boris scraped together the funds to get it back. Still, he had to move out of his $7 million London mansion and moved in with a friend. However, that friend is a multi-millionaire financier named Johan Elisic, who let Boris stay with him whenever the former tennis pro found himself in London. Becker wowed the world for three decades through the 70s, 80s, and 90s with his playing style on the tennis court. He'd dive head first for volleys and hit lethal serves that won him the nickname Boom Boom. The fans couldn't get enough of him, and the world was highly fortunate to have someone as talented as Boom Boom on the tennis court and on television. He won three Grand Slam singles titles, including two Australian Opens, two Wimbledon Championships, and one U.S. Open. He also won 13 Masters Series titles, three year-end championships, and an Olympic doubles gold medal. The Association of Tennis Professionals, or the ATP, and the International Tennis Federation, or ITF, named him Player of the Year in 1989. Becker successfully defended his Wimbledon championship in 1986, defeating number one ranked Ivan Lindel in the final. However, Becker, who was ranked second in 1987, lost in the second round of Wimbledon to Peter Dewan, ranked 70th. Becker also competed in a match that became one of the longest Davis Cup matches in history. He ultimately defeated John McEnroe in a six hour and 22 minute match. Becker dominated on grass and carpet courts, but wasn't the best on clay. He never earned a top level singles title on clay, though he came close in the 1995 Monte Carlo Open, almost beating Thomas Muster. Becker did win the men's doubles Olympic gold medal on clay in 1992 with Michael Stitch, and his successes added to his already impressive tennis resume. In recent days, Becker's been in and out of the courtroom for his bankruptcy trial, 
During the trial, the court learned that Becker earned $50 million in prize money and endorsements alone during his career, roughly $130 million in today's cash. Becker also coached Novak Djokovic. He worked with BBC as a commentator and served as a brand ambassador for various companies. All of that's to say, Boris should have a steady stream of cash coming in. So, why did he default on a pair of loans and wind up in bankruptcy court? Furthermore, why did he feel the need to hide certain assets from his creditors? Despite his enormously successful career, the former number one has struggled financially since his retirement in 1999. Many people wonder if he had a good financial manager. You'd assume someone who reached the pinnacle of tennis would be a top real estate investor or own a successful sporting team. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned for Becker. Boris Becker was recently condemned under the Insolvency Act and will serve half of the maximum prison term. In April 2022, a London jury convicted Becker of four separate crimes while acquitting him of 20 other charges related to his 2017 bankruptcy. He faced a seven-year prison stint but was only sentenced to serve two years and six months. However, this wasn't the first time Becker found himself in legal trouble. In 2002, Becker received a two-year suspended sentence in Germany for tax evasion and attempted tax evasion totaling over $1.7 million. The six-time Grand Slam champion disputed all of the allegations, claiming that he did everything he was supposed to do. He even put his wedding ring up as collateral. The prosecutor had a different opinion, saying Becker acted deliberately and dishonestly and just wanted to blame everybody but himself. Germans really love Boris Becker. Those who formerly admired his achievements had a hard time watching him fall so far from grace. It seemed like everything Becker tried outside of tennis only ended in failure. German fans watched as most of his business endeavors went up in flames. He tried being on TV and selling cars, but his lavish lifestyle kept getting in the way. Christian Schomers, who co-wrote Becker's 2013 memoir, Life is Not a Game, said Becker's extravagant spending was the only constant in his life. Schomers points to Boris's separation from his manager as the beginning of his downfall. His manager was fellow former tennis pro Ion Tiriak, a Romanian businessman known for his mustache and savvy money skills. Nicknamed the Brasnov Bulldozer, Ion acted as a father figure for Boris and helped keep him on the straight and narrow. Germans accepted that Boris was more popular in the UK than in his native country. They'd see him more often on celebrity TV shows, where he'd make a fool of himself. While he got paid to be on these shows, their degrading nature may not have been worth it. It was easy to see how humiliating these appearances were for Becker, but they may have been the only thing paying the bills. Boris's tax evasion narrative became public in the early 2000s, marking the beginning of his downfall. He lied on his tax forms to save $4.7 million and got caught red-handed. In December 1996, German courts launched a criminal probe into his tax affairs. Becker admitted to some inconsistencies at his 2002 trial. For years, he kept himself registered in Monaco, even though he lived in Munich. What's wrong with that? Well, Monaco is basically a tax-free haven. However, one must actually live in a tax haven to take advantage of it. Instead, Boris stayed in Germany. On October 24, 2002, the Munich District Court sentenced him to two years in prison for tax evasion. They ultimately suspended his sentence, which means he didn't have to serve any prison time. Still, he had to pay a $300,000 fine and donate $200,000 to charity. Becker struggled with gambling issues in the mid-2000s. However, he enjoyed gambling so much that he decided to do it as much as possible. He competed in the European Poker Tour and the World Poker Tour. And by 2013, he had earned more than $90,000 in poker winnings. Becker was a celebrity team member for the online poker platform Poker Stars from November 2007 to mid-May 2013. Becker debuted as a poker amateur at an April 2008 tournament in Monte Carlo. He reached the World Poker Tour main event at the Bellagio in Las Vegas that same year finishing in 40th place and earning over $40,000. In 2011, he finished 97th on the European Poker Tour in Barcelona, only winning $8,000. Becker went on to compete in many poker events for the next several years. He'd win a few thousand dollars here and there, but never earned anything close to his tennis days. You also have to factor in how much he probably lost during his poker career, which was probably a lot. Becker struggled with his love life in the middle of all his success. After dating Karen Schultz from 1988 to 1991 and Cassandra Hepburn from 1991 to 1992, Boris fell in love with Barbara Feltus, whom he married on December 17, 1993. She was eight months pregnant and the two tied the knot at the registry office in his German hometown. However, things didn't last very long. 
Becker wanted a divorce in 2000, and in response, Barbara took their two kids to Florida and filed the papers herself. However, this voided their prenuptial agreement, entitling Barbara to over two million. So, what happened? Well, one day a woman came up to Barbara and claimed Becker was the father of her child. In his memoirs, Becker talks about how he confessed to a one-night stand with a waitress while Barbara was pregnant with their second kid. In January 2001, the pretrial hearing aired on German TV. To them, it was basically the Johnny Depp Amber Heard of 2001. While Becker finally got his divorce, he had to pay Barbara $14 million in compensation. He also had to give her their Florida condo and full custody of their two kids. All things considered, this $14 million settlement was probably the beginning of Becker's financial ruin. Becker admitted to having an affair with a Russian waitress named Angela Emrakova after the media reported he was the father of her child. The two met at London's Nobu restaurant. Becker was out drinking after losing the 1999 Wimbledon Championship to Pat Rafter. Apparently, Angela offered him a warm shoulder to cry on and plenty more. Years later, a DNA test confirmed that Boris was the father of her child. Becker couldn't stay out of financial trouble, despite avoiding a $1.7 million tax evasion and sentence. Becker filed for bankruptcy when he failed to pay back a $4.6 million loan he'd taken out in 2013. Becker also owed another British businessman $1.6 million. Basically, Boris owed a lot of people a lot of money. Money he didn't have. However, instead of paying them back, Boris hid some of his assets so they couldn't be seized by the court. He didn't tell them about a $1 million property in Lehman, Germany, or the $66,000 worth of shares he had in a tech startup. Of the $50 million he made through his tennis career, Becker claims most of it went towards his divorce settlement with Barbara. And this time, instead of taking pity on him, the judge sent him to prison. After hearing Becker's case, Judge Deborah Taylor took his fall from grace into account. It's hard to ignore how Boris lost everything he had, including his family and reputation. Still, she didn't show any mercy. In Judge Taylor's eyes, Boris didn't show the slightest bit of remorse. Instead, he didn't accept his guilt and tried to distance himself from his own mistakes. Her gavel came down, sentencing Boris to 30 months in jail. What's the dumber crime? Risking jail time by switching out designer labels with fake ones just to save a few bucks, like Angelica Zabradina did? Or would it be trying to scam all the rich people around you when you're already rich, like Adriana Benhamu Weiss did? Let's get right into it. Number four, label switching. Angelica Zabradina is a self-proclaimed influencer, photographer, model, actor, and extra. She's known for walking into every store with a signature tote bag with her white chihuahua inside. But aside from her blonde hair, tan-skinned, bejeweled clothing, and little chihuahua, Angelica is also a scammer who stole over $1,500 from bargain stores in England. She specifically used fake labels to steal designer merchandise from TK Maxx stores all across London. TK Maxx is essentially the overseas equivalent of TJ Maxx. Basically, Angelica purchased designer clothes from TK Maxx, including dresses from Dolce & Gabbana, Balenciaga, and Stella McCartney, in addition to sunglasses from Brioni. Then she would go home, tear out the labels, and sew them into other items of lesser values. She would take the clothes with the fake labels to TK Maxx and return them, claiming she bought them online or from other stores, and receive a refund in the amount she paid for the original designer item. She printed multiple receipts for the same item so she could try and get the same large refund from multiple store locations. To buy herself more time to find a good dupe, Angelica sometimes returned the original designer purchase and then purchased it again to extend TK Maxx's 28-day refund policy. Jermaine Perry, the regional loss prevention officer for TK Maxx, said that Angelica stole about $1,500 worth of merchandise from the store. But eventually, some of the store associates started to catch on. There were inconsistencies between the items listed on the receipt and the items Angelica claimed to be returning. The designer labels she sewed into the counterfeit items were placed poorly, definitely not to the standards of the brand. One investigator looked at a counterfeit Balenciaga dress Angelica returned and could see where the original label was ripped out and another was sewn in. In another incident, Angelica purchased Brioni sunglasses and returned ones labeled Boucheron. She purchased three pairs of sunglasses for 96 pounds and 
use that receipt an additional three times to return the wrong item. In one Stella McCartney counterfeit item Angelica returned, there was a Made in Hungary label on the outside and a Made in Italy label on the inside. Angelica went on her crime spree between October and November 2018 before she got caught. The item that really got Angelica in trouble was a pink sequin Dolce & Gabbana dress valued at 250 pounds. The investigators saw that the dress was tampered with and the designer label was hanging off the back, not in typical Dolce & Gabbana style. CCTV footage showed Angelica walking into multiple TK Maxx stores towards the end of 2018. She was easily identifiable with the white chihuahua in her handbag. There was a trial at Prospero House, London's first Nightingale Court. Prosecutors told the jury about how Angelica printed multiple receipts to return the same white dress twice with a 300-pound price tag earning nearly $600. She denied eight counts of fraud by false representation. Number three, extreme couponing. One debate among the shopper community is whether or not it's ethical to resell items purchased with coupons. Many coupons forbid buyers from reselling items, and many people wouldn't buy secondhand groceries, but reselling is not actually illegal. But this Florida couple didn't just resell items purchased with coupons. They used fake coupons to buy products for free, and then sell them at a local flea market for a 100% profit. That's where our story begins. Sean Ernst and his wife Linda DeSilvio of Oak Hall of Florida, purchased and printed off fake coupons in 2014. They recruited accomplices, Charles McGregor and Christine Pierce, to find fake coupons that listed items as free. They purchased the coupons for a small price and then used them to buy everyday popular items like detergent, diapers, and dog food. They went into stores like CVS, Publix, Winn-Dixie, and Walmart six days per week to round up their items for their flea market booth or makeshift box truck roadside store. They persuaded customers to buy from them by selling the items at well below market price at about 25% off store value. They had nothing to lose because they used the coupons to buy those items for free. They sold $20 dog food for $15, $25 pamper diapers for $17 per box, or $30 for two boxes. The scheme worked well in their favor. Sean and Linda made an estimated profit of more than $140,000 from their fake coupons. Walmart was the couple's favorite victim, and it was the store that ultimately put an end to the scheme. Staff associates at Sean and Linda's local store noticed that the couple was buying tons of products in bulk and not paying much for it. Some of the staff members then saw the same couple at surrounding flea markets selling the same items. Walmart started combing over their customers' receipts and video surveillance footage and turned the evidence over to police. When Sean and Linda finally got caught, they denied knowing that the coupons were fake. But Sean did admit that any reasonable person would have questioned coupons offering free items, asking buyers only to pay the sales tax. After continued questioning, Sean acknowledged that some of the coupons were fraudulent, but continued to purchase them. Sean pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three years of probation and $1,200 in fines and court costs. Linda pleaded no contest and was sentenced to five years probation and $1,300 in fines and court costs. The couple was ordered to pay a total of $140,000 in restitution in Walmart. Both Linda and Sean were banned from ever entering a Walmart store again. Their accomplices, Charles and Christine, weren't charged with using counterfeit coupons to buy merchandise, but were charged with helping to sell the items. They were each charged with one count of dealing stolen property, but the charges were later dismissed. Number two, Little Miss Australia. Adriana Benhamu Weiss was an interior designer for the rich and famous, designing the mansions of Australian multimillionaires in hotels and apartment developments in Paris, Moscow, and the French Riviera. She also designed the interiors for luxury properties in Israel and the Middle East. Adriana herself grew up in New York, Paris, and London, and reached high society after marrying into one of Australia's most well-known business family, the Weisses. Australians, especially in Sydney, grew to love Adriana and her mother, Helene Benhamu, also a decorator, fashion mogul, and an up-and-coming cabaret singer. Tabloids photographed the mother-daughter duo arriving in Paris in couture gowns and popping champagne bottles. People were fascinated by Adriana's beauty and lifestyle. She became a regular at gold dinners and silver parties and started lunching with Sydney's wealthiest women who called on Adriana and Helene to help them redesign their luxe homes. But in a few short years, Adriana's enviable life came to a screeching halt with the help of a single WhatsApp message. 
DEC Services hired Adriana to help them renovate their offices at Bond Street in Sydney. She got the job by promising DEC a lower price for the same service that her competitors were offering. Adriana said that because she owned a furniture manufacturer and distribution center in Dubai, she could secure a lot of the supplies from her own facilities at a fraction of the cost. She asked DEC to make the payments up front and urgently so she could disperse the money to her subcontractors to get supplies and start working. The company paid her $325,000 immediately, and that's when things started to get suspicious. Adriana hired a junior worker from her firm, Benhamu Designs Party Limited, in 2015 and wasn't careful about what she put in writing. In a WhatsApp message to the employee in 2016, Adriana asked her to use Photoshop to falsify payment confirmations. The confirmations made it seem like the $325,000 that DEC gave her went directly to suppliers and contractors, when in reality, Adriana kept it all for herself. Investigators raised eyebrows when they noticed that Adriana's payment confirmations included misspellings and incorrect addresses. That's when they intercepted the WhatsApp message Adriana sent to her employee asking for these alleged payment confirmations to be created on Photoshop between November and December 2016. Adriana suddenly liquidated her company in 2018. The business, which at one time boasted elite prospects like Point Piper Mansions and a hunting lodge for a Russian oligarch, owed $8 million to the Australian tax office. The liquidator's report said that Adriana's company was trading even though it was insolvent since 2015. The report said that Adriana was aware of the insolvency yet proceeded to conduct business anyway, allowing the company to rack up $7.5 million in debt while insolvent. Adriana blamed her company's failure on poor management and customer disputes. In 2018, it came out that Adriana had fallen out with luxury car importer and super yacht enthusiast Neville Crokey and his wife Natty Crichton, who hired Adriana after meeting her through mutual friends. Natty was so impressed with Adriana's resume that she hired her to find the luxury furnishings for her $45 million Point Piper mansion next door to former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's lavish home. But things turned ugly when the Crichtons got frustrated after waiting months for their furnishings to arrive. They directly contacted the European furniture manufacturers to check the status of their order, only to find out that their hundreds of thousands of dollars of deposit money was never received. They called lawyers who were able to get their money back, but getting a refund didn't save Adriana's tumbling reputation. Adriana tried to save herself by blaming third-party furniture manufacturers, but it didn't help. As if Adriana wasn't embarrassed enough, her husband, Daniel Weiss of the famous Weiss family, divorced her. The separation was highly publicized. But Adriana's downfall didn't stop her mother, Helene, from claiming the spotlight. She made headlines in Paris as a finalist for the French team in Eurovision. She used the stage name Helene in Paris and became known as an eccentric jazz singer with big gestures and crazy outfits. She was one of 12 contenders chosen from thousands of people who auditioned. But Helene in Paris lost her shine after performing Paris Mon Amour on French national television and losing her top spot. But she still posts videos of herself singing French songs on YouTube. Helene has had quite the interesting life. She was born in Morocco and lived in Casablanca until age 13, after which she moved to Paris with her family. Then she moved to the United States in the 1980s to work in fashion and interior design and then hosted her own show on the Home Shopping Network. Then she moved to London to focus on decorating. When things didn't work out with riding on the back of her daughter's success, she moved back to Paris in 2019. Meanwhile, Adriana, a newly single mother of two, now splits her time between Sydney and Paris. She launched a new decorating company called Iconique Studio and is working under the name Adriana Shore. Adriana pleaded guilty to three charges to be dealt with under the Corporations Act and to a further three charges to be dealt with under the Crimes Act. Number 1. Eastern Metal Securities Roger Nils Jonas Carlson launched the website for Eastern Metal Securities in November 2012, stating that the company was headquartered in Singapore and operated out of branch offices in Bangkok, Thailand and Vitian, Laos. Roger, the big boss of EMS, is a Swedish citizen who lived in Thailand with his Thai wife. Starting in 2006, before he even launched the EMS website, Roger used three websites to communicate potential investors. The main point of investment was the pre-funded reverse pension plan. PFRPP. While his website doesn't state what the PFRPP is, he promises investors a payout of 1.2 kilograms of gold per share. The first share costs $98 and following shares cost $38 each. 
In 2015, 1.2 kilograms of gold was worth more than $45,000. Such a high return on investment seems impossible, and Roger never explained on his website how it worked, except to say that the risk of loss was eliminated. He promised that in case the payout didn't happen, he'd be able to refund investors at least 97% of their original investment. He posted frequent updates on his website about this amazing investment opportunity and that it would not be available again. Roger received payment from his investors via Bitcoin, Perfect Money, and Seagold. In essence, investors were promised a payout of $45,000 for a $98 or $38 investment. Sounds like quite the steal. And it was, but not for investors, only for Roger. As it turned out, Roger was using the same IP address in Thailand to answer from several email addresses, operate three websites, and go under many names. Some of the online names he went by include Joshua Millard, Lars Gorgensen, Krister Jolson, Paramon Larisov, Kent Westerberg, Euclid Deodorus, and Steve Hayden. Some of these people were supposed EMS employees, while others, allegedly, ran other companies entirely. But investors started to grow concerned when they noticed that many EMS employees were making identical spelling and grammar mistakes. Roger even claimed that one of the employees, Euclid Deordis, had died. He wrote a memorial post on his website and used it as a way to encourage people to invest more money because it's what Deodorus would have wanted. But there was no record of a Euclid Deodorus residing in New York. In fact, none of the other names associated with Roger's IP address turned up on any record. When investors expressed concerns, Roger shut them down immediately. He threatened them, saying that if they broadcast their concerns to others, they would never receive their payout. Adding to the pile of evidence was the fact that Roger exclusively used Bitcoin, Perfect Money, and Seagull, all forms of virtual currency. Virtual currency is often used for investment schemes because it's decentralized, irreversible, and has very little in the way of anti-fraud or money laundering checks. The IRS started investigating Roger under suspicion of an investment scheme. Roger targeted 3,600 people around the world. 31 of them resided in Northern California. Investigations revealed an additional 195 individuals that used Coinbase to transfer a total of $890,000 to EMS. The IRS traced 8.6 Bitcoins, valued at nearly $40,000, and another 11 Bitcoins at $61,000 transferred to accounts linked to Roger. His scheme operated from 2013 to 2019 with Roger stating that he was working with the SEC to ensure a payout. But the SEC denied ever working with Roger or any of his so-called companies. Roger's financial records revealed that he spent the majority of the cash his investors sent him and there wasn't nearly enough to pay his victims back. Roger was charged with wire fraud, specified unlawful activity with the intent to conceal or disguise the nature, location, source, ownership, or control of the proceeds. He pleaded guilty to all the charges. In total, Roger received $11 million on behalf of EMS by using wire fraud to convert virtual funds to cash for personal use. In July 2021, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison for securities fraud, wire fraud, and money laundering charges. He had to forfeit several properties in Thailand, including a luxury resort and a money judgment of more than $16 million. Who were some of the dumbest criminals out there who were just begging to get caught? Olsi Behaluli posted the money he made from dealing on Twitter. And Lorraine Graves actually commented on her own most wanted Facebook post made by police. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Number 4. Model Citizen Olsi Behaluli used his above-average looks to garner meager fame on TV, then dashed it all with a photo showing him surrounded by some 240,000 pounds in drug money. The man claimed he had previously appeared on dating show My Little Princess, featured on Channel 4. With the show's IMDb page barren and clips all but scrubbed from the web, that claim is difficult to verify. In any case, details about his life aside from that are fairly sparse. For those who aren't privy to the 2013 flash-in-the-pan phenomenon that was My Little Princess, it was a dating show conducted in about the most over-the-top manner possible. The ridiculousness included challenges like guessing the princess's favorite conspiracy theory and singing karaoke to her during her first meeting. Knights or contestants who didn't get into the princess's good graces were tossed into a moat by a giant in armor. <laughs> no, seriously. Behaluli didn't become a prince after the show. Instead, he fell in with a drug-running gang and then royally blew it, getting himself jailed in one of the dumbest ways possible. 
but you don't need to start dealing like Olsi here to have a luxurious lifestyle. Bespoke Post, our sponsor for today's video, will add luxury to your life without costing you millions. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club with a touch of class. Most of Bespoke Post's products are made by small, independent businesses, many of which are based right here in the U.S. From home decor to stylish accessories and drinks, you'll never have to shop online again. The best part is, you decide exactly which boxes they send, which are catered to you based on a short questionnaire you fill out. You only pay for what you want. You'll get a box assigned to you each month based on the quiz you take when signing up. Before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you'd like to keep it, swap it for a different box or offer, or skip the month entirely for absolutely no charge. You only pay for what you want. Plus, the box lineup changes every month. Whatever your lifestyle, they've got something for you. Pick the nightcap box, for example, and you'll get a pair of laser-etched crystal whiskey glasses, minimalist leather coasters, diffuser bottle of amber and oak moss scented oils, and even a book of crossword puzzles to wind your night down with. Or for you busy work bees out there like us here at Pablito's Way, the concentrate box includes a cold brew iced coffee maker, a stylish desk set made of brushed concrete, and a bottle of artisan bitters to add a dash of floral notes to your morning brew. Each bespoke post box is worth around $70, but as viewers of our channel, you only pay a fraction of the price. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter code PABLITO20 at checkout. Or go to bespokepost.com forward slash PABLITO20. Let's get back to Behaluli. He even took associates Basim Topali and Azim Prashka with him. Members of one of the many notorious gangs that have a stranglehold on England's illegal drug market to this day, the three were all part of the same operation, which made it possible for a Behaluli's mistake to blow the whole thing apart. If you're raking in lots of cash, you may be tempted to flaunt it. For people like internet influencers and celebrities whose continued raking in depends on showing off the cash they've already got, that makes sense. For a model and drug dealer, <laughs> yeah, not so much. Behaluli apparently didn't get the memo. The dude posted a photo to Instagram surrounded by mountains of cash. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to guess what happened next. The cops arrested Behaluli himself first. He tried to cover for his gang, saying that the photo in question was taken in Albania with a relative's money. London's finest didn't buy it. They raided the gang's stash house and arrested two other members. Police ultimately broke up the whole operation, which amounted to some four million pounds between cocaine and heroin. Behaluli is just one of many criminals flexing their wealth online where their actions have backfired. Even so, the judge didn't go easy on the group of thugs. The former dating show star caught an 11-year sentence out of a total of 31 years between him and his two goons. Topali and Prashka, once they've served their 10-year sentences, will be headed back to Albania. Wealth signaling has been a prominent gang activity around the world, but in the UK, it's picked up a special significance in the past few years. Notable Albanian gangs, such as the Helbanians, have been going as far as producing music videos. The goal seems to be attracting more young men from their homeland to join in and tighten the gang's stranglehold on UK criminal enterprises. That practice may be a bit more restrained in the future, since these arrests have made it clear that authorities are watching out. Behaluli's personal Twitter account has been been active recently and seems to indicate that all is well with his life as a model. Given the implied but unproven gang ties, there's no way to know at this point if he's going to reoffend. Albanian gang culture seems to run on loyalty and vengeance, but on the surface at least, it appears that the star of this story has reformed. Number 3. Brotherly Dumb David Guerrera, 17, and Ezra Guerrera, 21 recently caught charges in Texas thanks to Instagram posts by David showing off the pair's guns and cash. Life can be tough for young brothers living together without a parent, but these two didn't make things any easier for themselves by falling into the wrong career track. The pair had been living together in the south side of San Antonio in the lead-up to the arrests. Alerted to the social media postings, the Bexar County Sheriff's Office moved on David first. They found him in traffic, and during the stop, they discovered a loaded gun, hash oil, and 
and cash in the car. David was detained on the spot, along with his older brother who was riding shotgun. A search of the pair's home yielded more weapons, marijuana, cocaine, and $15,000 in cash. The pair were booked immediately. Texas law, strictly speaking, still criminalizes marijuana in all its forms. The only statewide exception is non-smokable hemp, with a few caveats. Even so, many products with an extremely low or negligible concentration of THC are allowed. Additionally, many police departments and even entire cities and counties are simply refusing to prosecute for small amounts that could conceivably be for personal use. That didn't do the brothers much good. Along with weapons and traffic charges, both brothers got controlled substance charges for the cocaine. The marijuana, meanwhile, was found to be in excess of the four-ounce legal limit for a misdemeanor charge in Texas. This makes it an automatic felony and made the cops throw the book at the duo that much harder. As of this writing, the case seems to be ongoing. We'll have to wait and see what the criminal justice system does with these two wannabe hard cases. Number 2. Comment Section Lorraine Graves must have felt like a real celebrity when she commented on a public entity's Facebook post that was talking about her back in July of 2021. The hang-up? The post named her as an accessory to murder, and the comment got her arrested. The shooting happened in March, and the original post from the Tulsa, Oklahoma police went up on a Wednesday. The very next day, Graves was arrested. The details of the crime aren't easily available as of this writing, but sources say that the unfortunate person, Eric Graves, was shot and his body found inside an apartment. Whether it was his own wasn't laid out. Another victim was also injured. The two perpetrators, Jaden and Gabrielle Hobson, were actually brought in first, leaving police on the hunt for Graves. She wound up on the very top of the city's most wanted list. That's not the kind of fame you want to embrace. But Graves' comment asking about reward money lightened the mood considerably in light of how serious the crime was. Police couldn't help but rag on Graves after she outed herself. In a more open and shut case, there would definitely be room for such gloating. This one, well, things got a bit more complicated. Not long after Lorraine Graves shot off her mouth, then mugged for the camera in handcuffs, there was a major break in the case that completely revamped authority's suspect list. A man previously thought of as only a witness, Wendell Alexander, now faces first-degree murder charges alongside Jaden Hobson. Evidence indicates two shooters, and new details have brought to light that Jaden and Wendell were the likely trigger pullers. Lorraine's original charges of accessory to murder weren't modified all that much. After her cousin was gone, she was thought to have helped hide the guns used in the crime and protect the criminals. Gabrielle Hobson, meanwhile, is alleged to have helped hide evidence, including the corpse, and taken items of value from the victim after death. This complicated case is still in the air as of the latest update from our local sources, which dropped in September of 2021. Number 1. 24-Hour Health Francis Noble of Hertfordshire, England, was in need of 24-hour care. Due to a neurological condition, she was no longer able to feed herself, take care of household obligations, head out in public, or do any of the numerous other things that most of us take for granted. The poor woman was bedridden and needed carers on staff around the clock to ensure that her needs were met. Her condition put her into a bedridden state as far back as 2005, and she petitioned her local government for help in getting the care she needed. A common practice seen in the UK and abroad is to give the sick person a fixed stipend to pay out to carers of their choice. Hertfordshire County Council was glad to take care of one of their own, and over the course of more than 11 years, they paid out over £702,000. Here's the thing, though. It was all one big lie. The whole thing fell apart when authorities opened up an investigation in 2018. Noble admitted as much and said that starting in 2007, she was receiving money that she didn't actually need. She also admitted that herself, her daughter, and her son-in-law were living high on the hog with that money. The £702,000 and some change paid out since 2005 wasn't the amount that charges for the trio ended up being based on. Instead, the amount paid since 2007 was the basis for the charges coming up close to £625,000. The scam was a fairly elaborate one. The scam in its original form was fairly simple. Noble got money from the council to hire carers, and she didn't spend all of it on the intended care. She kept some of the cash for herself and hired her own daughter, Laura Borrell, who was paid a decent amount. 
Boral's husband, Philip, was also in on the whole thing. Using their part of the ill-gotten gains, the younger couple took off on a number of vacations. They went to places like San Francisco, Canada, and Boston. The pair even benefited from a GoFundMe set up in 2017 by Noble to help them with a big vacation. The story behind that one only makes things juicier. In 2017, the Boros went on ITV's This Morning. Laura, then 39, claimed that she was one of the youngest frontal temporal dementia patients on record. The pair regaled audiences with the struggles caused by the disorder, including Laura having to stop pursuing a career in law. Noble's GoFundMe page reportedly raised around 1,500 pounds towards a grand trip to help Laura make memories before her memory was affected by the disease. With the details of the case being as they are, the Boros claim to a neurological condition may seem dubious. According to Laura's attorney, the claim was legitimate. The first real signs of trouble came in 2015, when neighbors began to notice Noble being a lot more active than she logically should have been, given her condition. Notably, she was reported seeing out walking her dog, meaning she had to keep up with the animal. In one encounter, she was said to have spotted a neighbor spying on her walking the grounds around her home, then pulled her hood on and claimed to be a carer, not Noble herself. Another neighbor said that Noble was seen taking a home delivery of groceries. The reports coming in from neighbors included video evidence. Authorities simply couldn't ignore the situation any longer and launched their own investigation. They began observing Noble's residence, and what they found sealed the deal. Not only was Noble up and about when she was claiming to be bedridden, but there were no indications of any visits by care staff. Naturally, authorities pounced. Police nabbed the Borals in short order, but Noble gave them the slip. When the heat was officially on, Noble decided to lay low in Berlin. Specifically, she settled in Rohrwalele, a somewhat affluent suburb not far from Berlin's limits in 2019. Even so, St. Albans Crown Court managed to have proper hearings about the matter. One hearing happened with Noble present to admit to fraud by false representation, and another happened without her. In the end, all three fraud fraudsters were sentenced. The three admitted to a limited number of counts that don't quite add up to the grand sum involved in the whole scheme. What they did decide to admit to in court was enough to earn them all some serious jail time. The Borals came together to admit to a joint charge of receiving criminal property, about 184,000 pounds in all. The two got their own individual charges as well. Laura confessed to receiving criminal property in the amount of 39,700 pounds. Philip pulled down a significantly lower amount, admitting to only 6,218 pounds. Noble, meanwhile, admitted to one count of fraud and one count of transferring criminal property for 130,649 pounds. Noble, being the ringleader in the whole affair, was sentenced to four years and nine months in jail. As of this writing, she's awaiting extradition from Germany to serve her sentence in England. Laura Burrell, the daughter, got three years and nine months. Philip Burrell, the son-in-law, was sentenced to four years and three months. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comments section who you think the dumbest scammer is on this list.